En el episodio número 41 tuve la oportunidad de conversar durante la prueba de sonido de su concierto en Bogotá con Alex Capranos, el líder y fundador del grupo Franz Ferdinand. Capranos y su grupo se hicieron famosos por Take Me Out, una de las canciones más grandes de comienzos de este siglo XXI y un baluarte del rock independiente europeo. Con la llegada de la fama, Capranos mantuvo la cordura y sigue estando vigente y su música sigue siendo relevante hoy en día. En esta charla, Alex cuenta esa historia, la historia de Take Me Out, su ética a la hora de tratar a sus fans, su pasión por la cocina, por los vinilos y su mirada siempre puesta en el futuro. Alex Capranos, de Franz Ferdinand, es mi invitado muy especial al episodio número 41 de El Podcast por Canal 13. Everybody's doing lists on the end of the decade. What's your list? Where would you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you'd start in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, uh, I, I, I'm not very good at lists. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I don't, I'm not a list maker. I, I, I'm the kind of guy that turns up at the supermarket and kind of goes, oh yeah, what was it? I wanted again. Um, and I should get into the idea of looking back a little bit more. Um, maybe as an artist, I've always felt I wanted to look forward, not look back. Right. So it it kind of goes against my instincts to look back the way because I guess I've always been afraid of living in the past and living on what I've done before. So I'm not a natural list maker. Is the present the place to be in uh, that sense? Yeah, the present or looking to the future as well. Yeah. Um, looking to what you're going to do next. You know, I, I think... Uh, as an artist, that's what keeps you alive, you know, like l looking forward to the future and thinking what your next move is going to be and where you can move on from what you've been before. It's crazy how things work in art nowadays because <coughs> back then, you know, I, and, and when I say back then, I'm talking about the 90s and, mm -hmm. you know, I guess the end of decade, uh, in, uh, besides being a moment for reminiscing and looking into the past and seeing what worked and what didn't, also makes you a bit nostalgic about uh, better times in, in, in the sense <sighs> that back in the 90s, you know, uh, um, you, would l you would see artists looking into the future in a very, in a very um, different manner as to how they look uh, into the future nowadays in the sense that it would take them six, seven months to create a record, to produce an album. Nowadays, I see artists like J Balvin or urban artists looking into the future, but doing it right now, you know? It's kind of weird. I was looking into some of the music that Balvin made over the uh, course of three or four months. And it was like, dude, here's this guy looking into the future, but he's just, you know, working every step, every day at a time. No, I, I, I like this. Uh, and I think in recent years, you've seen artists are less caught up in the album cycle idea, like the idea that you have to spend two years working on an album before you can release something else as well. And... Uh, I like that. I, I like the idea that you can move a little bit faster and it shouldn't take too long. Um, sometimes it can be frustrating, you know, the, the, the time between actually creating a song and for actually getting out into the world. Um, and it, it can be faster nowadays. I don't see why it shouldn't be. Well, how do you approach that uh, um, process nowadays? Because you have always been an album kind of band. Mm -hmm. um, how do you... How do you come to terms with the fact that people are just consuming music so fast? Yeah, I, I, I guess it changed for us a little while. Like two years ago, before this album came out that we did, we, we did a song called Demagogue. Um, and we recorded and released that within about a week. Uh, I think it was like five days between writing, recording, and it actually being on streaming services. So it was kind of incredible to see how, how quickly you can work. And so I think we have to, maybe our record label likes doing it in a more traditional way. They like the, the album cycle, so maybe we have to surprise our label sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I love our label. And Domino are an incredible label, an, an independent label, and they've been so supportive of us over the years. But um, I, I, as an artist, I think you have to take a certain amount of control of your own destiny as well. You can't just allow the machinery around about you to keep on moving. Yeah. There was, a, there was a moment about your career or around your career where being independent also n not only meant... Uh, 
being a musician of that moment, being a musician of today, back then, mm -hmm. but it also meant crossing over, which was really weird, strange times in the sense that you caught people's attention in a mainstream kind of way. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess that was, it was simultaneously a surprise for us and also what we always thought should have been the case. Because in, in my head, what we were playing was pop music or what pop music should do, music that was direct, had strong melodies and a strong beat. But the background that we were coming from was very much a, an outside background, like a kind of a DIY background, you know? Like, like totally. A, yeah, like, I mean, the, the bands that I started off, we would play punk squats around about Holland and that sort of thing. That was our idea of a tour. Um, we, we never really kind of thought we would have like a, a, an access to the mainstream and a breakthrough to the mainstream that we ended up having even though we were playing music that we thought should have been there. Yeah. Was it tough? Uh, in, in spite of the fact that you were pretty much in touch with that pop side of yours, but yeah. you also had the DIY side of yourself and your band, uh, was it tough to come to grips with the reality of just having this massive hit all of a sudden? Yeah, it, it was bizarre. You know, it, it's, it's funny when you're talking about, you were talking about the 90s as well. I, I see it with a band like Nirvana as well. I, I, I think, like, if, if you listen to um, a song like Smells Like Teen Spirit, it's a total pop song. Totally. But you see the background of that band and where they came from. They did not come from a pop background. And But you could see that he always loved pop music. And I think there's a similarity with our band and our approach to it. We came from the outside and kind of love the what pop music does to you and the in the in the purest sense of the word and i think about other bands like that as well i think of the b52s or the dead kennedys or, or new bands like amel and the sniffers i think they're like that as well and and um but as, as for actually happening at the time um the, the, the way I had it dealing with it was kind of thinking of it almost like a game, you know, like, like not to fully accept the reality of it. Just kind of, like, kind of like, oh, here's a bizarre thing that's happening in my life, you know, like, let's, uh, let's have some fun with it. Let's enjoy it. Otherwise, I'll go fucking crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good that you didn't. Uh, and, well, I did it a couple of times. <laughs> I think everybody, I think anybody that experiences it kind of like, it, it, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's quite a changing shock to your system. Like, nothing's ever quite the same afterwards. And here's the thing. I was... Yeah, here's the thing that really impresses me about you particularly. And it is something that doesn't quite happen in the pop world, in the rock world, in the music, in the music business world. You're being so approachable. You're being so kind, so nice to... Uh, people in the press, in the media, so open-minded to uh, getting people ask you questions, so open-minded to actually asking questions on social media, everywhere oh, you yeah. go, you know? How, how do you... Because you don't get this chance anymore to connect with artists in a little more personal level. Most of the times, you know, people, artists just take the money and they run. Right, you know, okay, they, yeah. They, they, and you can't blame them for that, but once again, you, you, you seem to be an exception to that rule. Well, if, if for me, like, I, I'm, I'm not going to judge other artists because also like speaking to people and, and, and interviews and general human interaction can be very difficult for some people. And I, I understand. And there are times where I feel like that as well. It's just like, oh, I've got to be in a room on my own. I, I, I need some space. But generally, my approach comes from my own experience, like, like, like most of us in life. I remember being a little kid I used to be obsessed with Doctor Who. And uh, I remember, so my two celebrity experiences when I was a kid were with Tom Baker, who was Doctor Who when I was a little kid. Right. And with Terence Dix, who, this is getting really nerdy here, but like, he, <laughs> used, he, he used to write the Doctor Who stories. And both of them were so generous, like, like so kind. I was so nervous before I met both of them. Like, like, really kind of, oh my God, like Doctor Who especially, like Tom Baker. And he said, I remember him saying he liked my mittens. And I was like, kind of, oh my God, that's so cool. Just, but just that tiny little fraction of time that he took, like really made me feel 
I don't know, just brought some happiness and worth into my life from very little effort from him. And so I've remembered that and also Terrence Sticks and also a second-hand negative experience as well. I remember, I'm not going to say who the band was because I'm not going to bitch, but um, <laughs> my, I, I remember my sister uh, being a huge fan of, of, of a band that were headlining a festival I was playing at with another band years ago. This is in 1999. And uh, she went around, all of the members of the band got their autographs before selfies on the phone or anything like that. And um, as she approached the singer, she was quite young at this time, about 14 maybe. And as she approached the singer, yeah. she saw her coming, didn't say anything to her, just turned to a security guy and went like that. And the security guy went along and picked her up and like got rid of her. And oh. I, I remember at the time thinking like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, like uh, he might've been tired, he might've been, but he could have done it in a cooler way. And also, and it's not a criticism of him, but I definitely understood the experience that my sister had. And I remember at the time thinking, if I ever get in that situation, I'm just going to try and be a bit, bit cooler yeah. about it, you know. So that you learned from that experience. Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's what we all do, isn't it? We learn from our own life experiences, which is why you have to have experiences so you can learn from them. I think sometimes it all, uh, it w what's happened to rock and roll also has a lot to do with the business side of it and how musicians move across the social ecosystems and, mm. you know, how they approach those situations. I also understand it's pretty tough to be a public figure and to be a massively renowned or recognized kind of person. But like I said, it's always very impressive to see that every time you come to the city, that everywhere you go, you leave this great impression upon people because of who you are, because of how you behave with others. You know, you don't get that happen anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons why rock and roll is also on the downs on the uh, downside. I, I don't know. I mean, like, like, like I, I, I think of most of the bands that I know and most of the bands that I hang out with, like they're they're cool guys, and you know, they're they're they're, they're decent to talk to, and. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the the rule in life is just whether you're in a band or whatever it is you're doing, just, just don't be a dick, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how did uh, the whole uh, vinyl experience work for you this time? Did you manage to get to go check yeah. out some stores or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went record. I, you know, I love going record shopping. Um, because quite often you'll find things that you wouldn't find on streaming services or I, I just like records as well. I, that's my favorite way to listen to music still. And I think also, you know, we all have the medium with which we were first um, exposed to music through. It always means the most to us. And so somebody who is a kid at the age of streaming, streaming will be their, their medium, but for me, my parents gave me a little record player when I was a kid, a second-hand dance set record player and a pile of seven-inch singles from the 1960s. And there was all sorts of some novelty things, a lot of Beatles, things that they weren't listening to anymore, some old Elvis stuff, like a lot of old rock and roll. And so I just remember the visceral joy of listening to records on the record player. And I still have that joy in my life. And so I like when I come to a city where I know there's music that I love from that place, it's great to go shopping and, and to find singles to take home. And when I came to Bogota, uh, Danny, who I was hanging out with yesterday, took me down to this cool shop uh, called Cosmos Zapatos. I don't know if you know Yeah, it's a shoe shop. Yeah, <laughs> it's a shoe shop, right? It's, which is perfect for me because I'm a shoe obsessive. I, I mean, I, as you can see, like I, uh, and so I managed to get a pair of shoes and uh, like 50 or 60 records as well. So um, oh, you got the shoes too. I got a pair of shoes as well, so yeah, yeah, like it's 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 the perfect shopping experience for me. Yeah. So you got fifty, sixty records? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, like I, well, I, I fifty-three. I'm being a total nerd about. It. Yeah, I got I got fifty-three singles. But what was cool was like he had this room and he had everything sorted into different boxes, and there was a box of more Colombian kind of stuff, and and then I went through and sorted out the ones that were cumbia, and then he had a deck downstairs. So I was going through it. So I make I make three piles when I'm listening, like kind of like nah, maybe, and then oof, yes, definitely, definitely, I love that one. 
<laughs> and so then I went back and listened to the middle one, and, and that, yeah, ended up with 53, definitely. So. Of all the 53 singles that you got, which ones did you listen to, and which ones did you just, you know, buy because of the cover? I didn't listen to, I, I didn't buy any because of the cover. Like, I, I, all because of what they do to me. But I, I, I know, and you're probably the same as well. I think everybody is like this. When you hear a song, you know within a few seconds whether you're going to like it or not. Totally. You know, like, I, I, I can hear just a few bars of a song. I can like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be into this. And so what's exciting about this experience is I've gone through these. I've listened, kind of lifted the, the needle and put it all along the different grooves. Kind of go, yep, 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 that's a cool song. I'm going to listen to the whole song when I get back to Scotland, you know. And so I've got that to look forward to now, but I know that there's some great songs in there. Where were you brought up in Scotland? So when I first moved to Scotland, I moved to Edinburgh and I went to kind of primary school in Edinburgh and then I moved to Glasgow when I was 10 and went to secondary school in Glasgow. What was it like? What was it like? <sighs> I mean, to me, it's very ordinary, but from a Colombian perspective, it's probably pretty weird. <laughs> um, it was an ordinary state school. Um, I lived in a fairly ordinary suburb. Um, the one thing that was different for me was uh, I accidentally ended up being a year younger than everybody else in my year. And that probably made my school experience a little bit different. I was like the little guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, yeah. that happened to me too. Oh, did it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but okay. I was brought up in the U.S. I was brought up right, in, okay. in yeah, Florida. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's so when I arrived in, you know, South Florida, I was like um, 13 years old. Uh huh. And uh, I went to uh, I went to ninth grade immediately. Right. And I thought I was gonna get pushed back because of the language thing, you know. But I knew my English pretty well back then, so I stayed there. But all the people in ninth grade in the U.S. were way older than me well right. not way older but a couple of years yeah right okay, and it was yeah. very, it was a, it was pretty tough yeah <laughs> i found it pretty tough as well because like, the same thing happened to me so i, I started school in the northeast of england and uh, it, it, there you start school when you're four in scotland you start when you're five so when i came up to scotland it would have been my fourth year of school in england but in scotland to be the same age, I would have gone into the third year. I said, oh, you've been at school for four years. You go in with the older kids. And so it was the same for me. And it is. You definitely see things from a different perspective. I think psychologically, it's you definitely feel... I mean, nowadays, like a year difference when you get to... My, I'm, I'm presuming you're not too far from me in age. I don't know. But like, like when, when, when you get over the age of 20, a year's difference doesn't really mean much. Totally. But when you're six... A year is a sixth of your life, you know, it, it's, it's massive, you know, and um, yeah, I, I definitely felt on the outside throughout school and I am absolutely convinced that anybody who gets on a stage is overcoming some form of childhood difficulty or trauma and I've, I've talked to other musicians about this and specifically singers. There's always been something happened at some point that has made them feel that that is an acceptable or natural or obvious route for their life to take. Because it's not really. It's a <laughs> weird thing to do with your life. It is. Yeah. It's you have a to weird stand thing. in front of yeah. I don't know, a crowd. Did you ever do it when you were in school? That, were you prone to, I don't know, performing or doing no, theater? No, I, I, I wasn't one of those kind of like show kids like who would come in kind of like, I, I, wasn't, I was never the kind of like look at me kid. Like I was never the kind of like, uh, I wanted to make music from early on. You know, like I, my dad had a guitar lying around the house and I was always picking it up. But it really started for me with my best friend, Andrew, who was also the same age as me. We were both like a year younger than everybody else. We were both obsessed with the Beatles, but this is in the 1980s, and it sounds weird saying this, at a time when the Beatles were very unfashionable, like mid-1980s, they were kind of like the, it seems weird saying it now, but they were kind of like the uncoolest band to listen to, and so we were obsessed It's with funny them. that they were ever uncool. It is weird to think about it, but they definitely were. They're, they're that period immediately after punk, 
Uh, they they were not considered cool. Then I remember the late eighties. There was like more of a reappraisal of that. Oh no no, they were, of course they were. Yeah yeah, amazing yeah. But um, so yeah. But my friend Andrew and I, we used to write music together. We started, but the way, way we started off was we wanted to play Beatles songs, so we had those books with the chord progressions in, and um, we hadn't really learned enough chords to play all the songs. So instead of doing the obvious thing of learning the chords, we just <coughs> We just used the, s the chords that we had and started writing our own songs instead. And yeah. that seemed like the obvious thing for us to do. When, when, does, when do you start the band? What, right after... With this band? Yeah. Oh, this band didn't start till years after that. So I was... No, not this band. I'm, oh, I'm oh, saying... Like, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess like uh, th that must have been about 15. I think I first played on stage when I was 18 or 19. But th this is the thing, like... Andrew and I didn't want to go on stage. We made, he used to have a four track in his bedroom. Cool. And, and we used to like record albums and albums of material. And uh, we would just finish it and he'd go, right, time to do another one. Let's do the next album. And then we would write another bunch of songs and like make another record and like spend ages recording it and do the next. We weren't interested in performing live at all. All we were interested in was writing songs and recording them. That's all we cared about. We didn't want to go on stage. That's pretty much the mindset of someone who lived in the 80s. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, you think so? You uh, think that's an 80s thing? Yeah. I think it was an 80s thing too, but, but because, I mean, I got in touch with live yeah. music. I, I was brought up in the 90s, but part of the 80s mm -hmm. were also, yeah. you know, a great part of my upbringing as a, as a music fan. Yes. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't really... Uh, come to grips and understand the beauty of live performing until my adult years because I spent most of my time as a kid listening to records and listening to the radio. It was kind of yeah. like the only thing. Yeah, I saw my, my dad performed and he played the guitar also uh -huh. during the parties at the house and things like that. But But, but to me, it was always about the radio. It was always about being in front of the little microphone and doing the little dis disc jockey thing and, and things until I finally, you know, started looking into the festivals and things and right, saying, okay. oh, okay. So this is actually, you know, the thing that really changed it for me was like, I, I remember we went to, the first concert I went to was Huey Lewis and the News because Back to the Future was my favorite film. <laughs> oh, I, wow. I but we went, it was like a huge auditorium and we got the tiniest seats in the furthest away we possibly could. And at the time this it's changed now but this auditorium in Glasgow had a terrible sound like the sound of this room was really bad and we were stuck in these seats we couldn't really make anything out I just remember us coming home kind of go like live music's pretty bad isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's just make records instead but it changed for me when I was about 18 And I started going to like more underground gigs in London, and like rather than the big gigs, like, so like in sort of like underground cellars. There was a place called the Thirteenth Note, and start seeing, I, I guess, coming from the more punk rock kind of aspect of things, the more DIY kind of attitude, and that's that's really what got me into live music. And it was seeing it in a room with 50 people going crazy. And that's and, and then it became a lot more visceral and a lot more real and a lot more attainable to me as well. I was like, oh yeah, I know that guy. He's doing that. I could do that if that guy's doing it. Rather than seeing that bizarre figure miles away on stage in the arena. Yeah, the whole Hugh yeah. Lewis thing. Yeah. What do you remember about that show besides the awful noise in the um, in the venue? I I remember they came on stage wearing kilts at one point and I wasn't very impressed. <laughs> but yeah, but actually, Lewis a good band. You know, he's a good singer, a good band. No, 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 and they were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And they were pr pretty big. Yeah, they were huge. They were huge. I mean, at that time, they were massive. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned the whole clandestine nature of uh, underground scenes because many people who will be watching this show and listening to it on the podcast will um, usually look up to people like you or the band and they think you know this is, is some sort of spontaneous combustion kind of thing uh -huh. where you know you just you know put a put a put out a song and get really big and right, that's no. pretty much it <laughs> and you know it, it's, it's, it's years of evolution you know it's and, and uh between so let's say i was 15 when i first started writing songs with andrew or, or maybe even younger like 14 uh, i was 31 when our first record came out so what's that 16 years or 17 years or whatever between first starting to play and then being at a point where i could 
stand on the stage like I'm going to do tonight. Yeah, and the, and the whole thing about, uh, once again, the, the underground scenes and the DIY scenes everywhere is that they look pretty much alike once you start looking into stories such as yours where, you know, you, you get to know the people who comprise that scene you know you, you you know that person you know that yeah. other person you know yeah, that place yeah. where you're, you're at you know and, and it sometimes seems so far away when you're in south america but then you you've got the same scenes going on here of course you have you i mean do. there must be there must be i mean i i imagine that here in bogota the, 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 there's, there's bands getting together or people performing we, we were out the other night there was a, a guy playing with a dj and stuff and speaking to danny like he's telling me about his music and i know there's an underground thing going on here and the at the music Music might sound different from what I grew up with in Glasgow, but I'm sure the attitude is the same. And for that, I, I, I've, I've got to say to everybody, in like, like, be inspired, be inspired by the people around about you, and inspire others as well. And those scenes always work the best when there is an element of both competition and generosity. You know, everybody's got to be competitive with each other. Like, oh, they did that. We're going to try and do something better. But don't do it with a bad heart. Do it, do it with, a, with, with, with a, a positive intention and do it in a generous way. And so say, oh, come on, let's play together. Let, let, let's support you. Come on, I'll help you out. You can borrow our drum kit. We'll borrow your amplifier. You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, keep a positive attitude. But still, competitiveness is good as well. Yeah, and competitive should be musicianship right musicianship and also putting on a great show you know you want to put on a great show like and, and like tonight you know we're playing with interpol i love interpol they're one of my favorite bands of all time um i'm friends with the guys in the band i'm gonna watch their show tonight i'm gonna love their show i love their records but damn it's gonna make me want to put on an, an incredible show because like if they're putting on an amazing show i'm gonna make sure i'm gonna put on a, a show that's as, at least as good as theirs <laughs> and that's exactly the same thing playing an arena like we do tonight or whether you're playing in front of 30 people in some bar in in town how hard is it to um Stay on top of the, on top of your game nowadays. How hard is it as opposed to 10, 20 years ago when you you let's say made it big? Um, is it harder to be a musician nowadays? I I don't know. I I, I think it, it it's all changed in so many different ways. There are so many subtle differences. Like for somebody starting out, it's easier to get music into the world because you can just uh, upload it uh, online. Also, recording is so much easier using computer technology. I mean, even the technology that we're using to record this podcast, it's it's so easy and affordable to get your hands on and to actually make and record music. But you don't have the financial support or the distribution that you would get from labels in the past. I don't know. I think it kind of balances each other out. In some ways, in some ways it's harder, in some ways it's easier. Um, Is it I, about songs? Oh, it's always about songs. Always. It's, 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 always, it's always about songs and performance. You know, that, that, that's, that's what's at the heart of it. If you write a good song, if we, we could spend hours talking about like the, the intricacies of the music industry and the, 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 the difference in the formats of the 1970s or the 1930s or the 2010s. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is a good song. A, a good song will last for centuries. And it will communicate with people across the world as well, you know. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I, th I think as a musician as well, that's all you've got to worry about. A good song and a good performance. I know it's really hard. And when you talk about intricacies, it would be even harder to actually pinpoint the success of a song. But um, you guys have pretty much nailed it on several occasions. And you have built a catalog, which is something that when... Uh, you approach new up and coming musicians or independent musicians is really tough to come to grips with when I speak to independent musicians in Bogota and I do it from this listener perspective because that's all I am. I'm just a big music fan. Sure. Uh, um, it's kind of hard to get them to understand that 
there's something about songs that make them successful. You don't quite know what it is from your yeah. uh, from the listener perspective, but it's <clears throat> when you approach an independent artist, it's, you gotta have a little mojo. You gotta have a little. It's gotta be there, and you know it's there immediately as well. You know when we were talking about me listening to the records, like you listen to like I was in three seconds of a song, and I know if it's good. Totally. You know, like, or, or if it's good for me, if it, if, it, if it gets to my heart, if it gets to my brain, if it gets to my feet, I know within a second. And you've got to, as an artist, you've got to understand that as well. And you know what? If you write one of those songs, great, write another. You know, like, don't, 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 don't stop, don't sit back. Like, uh, I, I think the most dangerous thing for an artist is to be, is to be complacent or lazy and to sort of say, oh, yeah, okay, I've done something cool, right? That, that's me. That's me sorted. Nah, nah, nah. You've got to, because you don't know your next song might be way, way better than that one. You've just, it should be, it should be. Or it might take you another 35 songs to get one to one that's just as good as that one. But you've got to go through those 35 songs and you're not going to get to that point unless you do that. Um, yeah. And it's funny because uh, some independent musicians or some up and coming artists would say, okay, that's like playing to the formula. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, you how know? do you mean playing to a formula? The, uh, because usually uh, musicians, new musicians, look at pop as yeah. being so formu formulaic. You know, like you have to do this in a certain kind of way and you can't leave that little square, you know? I, 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 I think that's a mistake because I think if you look at pop music, formulas do appear. Or rather, what happens is something new happens, then people copy it and sort of say, oh, yeah, I've worked out how to do it. This is the formula. I'm going to make my own version of that. Surely your ambition should be to invent your own formulas, invent your own recipes, invent... Like, think about it when you cook with food as well. Like, you want to invent your own thing. Like, like my, my favorite way to cook is to go to the market, find a bunch of ingredients and make something that day, not to follow somebody else's recipe. And I think as an artist, that's what you need to do as well. Don't look at somebody else's recipe. Don't work... Yeah. Like, understand how they did it and then work out something different for yourself. Yeah. Talking about cooking, you were kind of excited and interested in in, in cooking and the relation. And, and I've always found it find it interesting, the the relationship between music and cooking. I saw you talking to Wart Magazine uh, a couple of weeks ago right, about right, uh, right. this interesting relationship. Could you elaborate for our listeners? Yeah, I, 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 I find there's lots of parallels between the two worlds. I mean, that, that I was just talking just now. Um, maybe because it's two worlds that I understand. I used to be a chef and, and Bob, the bassist in our band, was also a chef. And we worked in a kitchen together. And when we worked in the kitchen, we talked about music and listened to music all the time while we were doing our prep. And that's where a lot of the ideas for Franz Ferdinand came about, like when we were in the kitchen. And I, I, I think there are so many parallels, you know, like, like when I was in a kitchen, when I worked in a kitchen, I was not the equivalent now. I was more like the equivalent of being a player in a covers band because I was a commie chef. I was, there's a hierarchy in the kitchen with the head chef up here, the dishwasher down here, and I was about here okay. <laughs> in the hierarchy. So I did what the head chef told me. Like, this is the, this is the menu for today. This is the recipe. You're going to make that, and you're going to make it well, and don't give me any problems. And that, that, that's, that's how it was. <laughs> As a head chef, then you've got more choice, and you can invent things, and maybe that's more like being an artist. How long did like, it take you to get up there? Oh, I, I was never at the top. I was, I was never a head chef. I, I never would, I, you know, I, and I, I think also as well, the thing in life is you've got to know what you're, you're good at, you know, you, and I, I, I'm, I don't have it in me to be a great head chef, you know, or rather I don't have the ambition to be a great head chef. Because you could have been. I think most people could do those sort of things if they really want it. And if it's a burning desire and it means a lot to them, you can learn how to do it and your passion will take you to that place. I enjoyed working in kitchens, but I didn't have the, the passion for working in a kitchen that I have for being a musician. Did you cook out of necessity? Was it, was it like a side job where you were no, playing? I, I enjoyed it. I, enjoy, I, I, I like it. I like the lifestyle. I like the kind of people that you find in kitchens. I find that the, the, the kind of people you find in kitchens are the same as you find on the road with bands. Like, like I, both musicians and the kind of people that end up in road crew. They're the people who thrive on antisocial hours. Anthony Bourdain said that. All oh, right, yeah, <laughs> it's totally true. And, and antisocial behavior, they, you know, they're, they're, they're um, it's a they're pretty like st 
simulants of all sorts. You know, like like it, it's it's the people that don't really fit in with regular society. That's funny both because both end up both on the road and in the kitchen as well. But Anthony Bourdain, like I, I remember when I was working as a chef, uh, that book Kitchen Confidential came out, and that was the first time. I sort of like had read a book and I thought, this is somebody who actually is explaining and writing about what life in a kitchen is really like. I'd, I'd never seen anybody write with that level of um, veracity since George Orwell did it quite well in Down and Out in Paris and London. But um, yeah, Anthony Bourdain did I it. I never read that sure. book. Down well, and Out in Paris and London. Yeah, yeah. So in, in that book, like, uh, it's, it's a very pertinent book to our times as well. It, so George Orwell, he... Um, he becomes homeless and lives on the streets of London and on the streets of Paris and writes about his experience. And he writes about working in the kitchens uh, of the big hotels at that time as a dishwasher. So he goes in and he describes the noise and the smells and, and some of it has changed, but some of it is very, very recognizable if you've ever been in a kitchen before. I've, all you hear about George Orwell usually is 1984, right? That's I guess that's, that's his most famous book. That's yeah, 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 that's his Take Me Out. Yeah. But going back to Bourdain and the veracity and the honesty with which he approaches the storytelling of cooks and chefs and kitchens all around the world, it was very eye-opening to read that book and to actually face the fact that these were outlaws you were dealing with, you know, yeah. people who were not really connected to society in a normal kind of way. It, and, it, and it's interesting to see the parallels between that and the music business from the insides, you know, from the guts of it. Yeah, totally. And, and also the other thing is as well is because the experience of that world behind the kitchen doors, you know, those swing doors through which the beautiful plates appear, they're completely different worlds from each other. And out front, it's this very refined, like a high-end restaurant, it's this very refined experience where everything is just perfect and everything is kind of worked out. And then behind, it's it's organized, but total chaos at the same time as well. Or it's wild, there's a, there's a lot of emotion and yeah, some pretty screwed up things going on. And yeah, it's kind of similar to this world that we we live in as well. When people come to a show, they see this spectacular thing. The glamour, and they're, they're, Yeah, and yeah, there's there's definitely a, a different side to it behind the stage. Yeah, the the um, the finer the restaurant, the filthier the, the, the kitchen. Filthier the kitchen, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long were you a chef for? I did it over years. Like like I I first trained on that sort of thing when I was about. My first job as a chef when I was, was when I was 18. I dropped out of university. I got a job as a dishwasher. One day, one of the chefs didn't turn up and the head chef threw some whites at me and said, right, you're a chef now. And I had to like cover. And, uh, and then for over the years, I did different jobs. Like before Franz Ferdinand took off, I was always a musician. That was always my main thing in life. That's always what I wanted to do. But I had so many different jobs to actually pay my rent. You know, like I, you have to pay your rent and for 10 years at least I couldn't pay my rent with, with the music that I made more than 10 years, like 14 years. And so I was a chef a lot of the time because being a chef is good. You can turn up in any town, you can get a good job as a chef. I was a barman, I was a delivery driver, I was a welder for a while. I sort of did some acting at one point. I, I taught, I did loads of different things. How old were you when you started my first working? Job, I was 16. 60, yeah, I, I got a job in a <laughs> high range sports. It was a, it was a shop that sold mountaineering equipment. I was so bad because <laughs> I, 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 I knew nothing. I still don't really know. Retail. Yeah, it was. It, I was just working like on the shop floor, and like people would come in for advice on like the best crampons or hiking boots, and I knew nothing about it. I was just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> like, like, try them on. Like, and so I wasn't very good at that. And then, yeah, I worked in, yeah, had loads of different jobs, retail, bars. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to a musician from here, from Colombia, who's very renowned. His name is Alejandro Duque. He's one of the biggest drummers in Colombia. He's been on all kinds of bands here. And we were talking about the importance of learning how to work at a young age, something that not many people really uh, learn to do unless they have to do. Right, you okay, know, because yeah, yeah. and I, and I was t talking to Alejandro and telling him, you know, it's uh, it's funny how, you know, uh, 
even though you have to work for a living, learning to do it can, you know, take ah. a lifetime. It also gives you discipline and it gives you experience as well. And, and also it removes um, any notion of privilege for your li from your life. I think I'm very lucky that I spent over a decade having to work and like having to work hard to like, you know, support myself. Because if when I was 16, I'd had the success that Franz Ferdinand had and I stepped straight from childhood into a life like this, I don't know, God, I, I, I'd, I'd be terrified I'd turn into a, an asshole, you know, like, like, because, <laughs> because it's a very privileged life, you know, you, you, that you have as a musician, and you see all these people that, that will run around and do stuff for you, you have a tour manager that does stuff for you, you have a, an agent that sorts things out, your, your hotel's all waiting for you there, transport, so you don't have to think about any of the, the actual organizational work of life, and it's good to have uh, appreciated what it was to actually work yourself, to see the work that everybody around about you is actually doing. And to put on a show like the show that we're playing tonight, there's a lot of hard work. A hell of a lot of hard work goes into it. And if you think about the crew that are working as well, they work their asses off. You know, they're in there first thing in the morning, setting up the stage, the local crew are with them, like putting in the speakers, putting in the PA, checking all the amplifiers, and then they're there, and then it's all ready for the show to happen. Then the band disappears. We go to some after party or whatever, but the crew has to stay behind and un unlock everything, load it into the vans and the lorries to take it away to the next gig. And it happens over and over yeah, and over and again. Yeah, and they do it. They, 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 they work their asses off. They really, really it's do. It's exhausting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and you've got to respect them. It's, a, it's an incredible job that they do. And the musician life is also exhausting and hard to deal with. When uh, you're successful, you can say, well, you I don't know. know. I mean, like, like, I, I never like to complain about it. Yeah, it's hard work, and you travel a lot, and it can be exhausting, but damn, I'm lucky. I, I'm so happy to have this life. I wanted this life all my life, you know, like, from when I was a kid onwards, this is what I wanted to do, and I'm not going to be that guy who kind of goes, oh, it was so difficult, and, like, we had to, like, get a van to the hotel, and it took a... I'm not going to moan about stuff. Like, it's, it's, it's just a great life that I have. I like being on tour. I love being on tour. I love being able to get on a stage in front of, like, thousands of people and to play for them. It's it's an incredible privilege. I'm, I'm not going to moan about it. Uh, when you drop dropped out of school, when you dropped out of college, what were you studying? What were you doing? I was studying divinity. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> divinity? Yeah, like theology. You're kidding me. It was kind of by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> How did you end up studying divinity? By mistake. Well, so... Oh, right, so when, when you apply for a university, like... like um, you, uh, you, have, you have two choices. You have your main choice. Right. And then another choice in case you don't get in there. And like, so when I was uh, applying, I wanted to study philosophy and my, uh, my first choice university. And uh, on one condition, I'd, I'd got the grades that I needed, but I hadn't passed my maths. I've always been really bad at mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was an arrogant little 15-year-old, and I was like, ah, I'll pass my maths next time, I'll be fine. So I said, insurance offer, that's like the second offer. I said, like, I just picked the first university on the list, which was Aberdeen, A at the beginning, and that's first first course, said, ah, divinity, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And so my exam results came through, everything was great, apart from mathematics, which I failed the second time. And I was like, oh, shit. I'm going to Aberdeen to study divinity. And so, like, divinity, it's a, it's a theology degree, and most of the people there were training to be ministers or priests in the church, and I was 17. I was just like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Yeah, and so, yeah, I, I dropped out. Wow. Yeah. That's an interesting story. you got got 100 plus and more stories to tell, but we got to go. But I wish you the very best. What's, what are your plans for the end of the year? For the end of the year, I'm going to go back to Scotland. I'm uh, going to spend Christmas with my family. Uh, this, is, this is very important for me. They're going to come around to my house and I'm going to cook for them. You know, I'm going to cook Christmas dinner, see my brother and my sister and their children. I have my, my parents there and my grandmother. It's great. I love having the family all together. And yeah, ma making the food for your friends and for your family, it's to me, it's the, one of the, the best joys in life. And I it's, can't wait. It's always great looking forward to seeing the parents, to seeing the family, yeah. to cooking for them. That's great. And 2020? 2020, I'm going to be writing some more songs and uh, I'm going to be producing as well. There's a band called Los Bichos who are a, a cumbia band based in London. Cool. 
and uh, I'm going to produce that record and write some more stuff and uh, enjoy life. Well, I can't wait to hear that record. Right, thank Alex, you. thank you very much for taking the time. It's been great meeting you. That's Good luck with the show tonight. You know, kick some ass. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Take care.